Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have eight ENTPs. So Chad, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yeah, sure. Um, hello everybody, my name is Chad Hostack. My pen name is Sam Hostack. I blog, I make music, and I just have a good time. That, that's the briefest way I could put, put it. Awesome, and I'll have everyone linked below. <laughs> Prem, would you like to tell us a bit? Six years back, I got slapped like there's no tomorrow. You know, I was like stranded away in a desert or something. And since then, I've read so many books, but I haven't implemented any of them. And my life came to this point where I know so much, but it didn't uh, represent in reality. So my YouTube channel, entp.nurture, is me trying to just actualize this concept, documenting my journey. And that's about it. Cool. <laughs> and Boris? <laughs> All right, my name is Boris. I'm an accidental finder of MBTI. I thought it was bullshit. I thought it was what HR uses to put a label on me because they don't know what to do with me. I accidentally fell into a Toronto N meetup group and I was amazed because the N connection is just, it's its undeniable. I'm running it now because I like the people I'm hanging out with. So that was less yeah. than 20 seconds. <laughs> I'm a part of Boris's online uh, meetup group. Yeah, it, it's really well run. <laughs> Uh, I, I run and, from a distance. I don't really run it, right? So yeah, you just let everyone run themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hi, um, I'm JC or Jay. Um, I run a YouTube account with um, my friend Nate Rasa, where we basically explore NE Unleashed because he is an ENFP. I'm an ENTP, so it's called Studio Three C Seven, and we just. We explore any topic actually, but we're just trying to show what NE is in its simplest sense because it's hard to try to explain it in words. It's easier to see how it works. So yeah, I guess that's my intro. Cool. And Morgan? Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> uh, my name is Morgan, ENTP. I am a personality profiler. My website is Morgan Fain, Morgan, F -A -N -E com. That's where I have all my appointments and everything. I enjoy writing too, a bunch of other things, but I'll just direct you guys to my site. So that's it. Cool. And Farah? Uh, my name is Farah and I am also a writer and I don't have anything done yet, but that's in the works currently. But uh, so since it's in the works, I would probably still link that to my Twitter or something. And then, um, Unfortunately, that uh, being a writer, you have due dates and stuff that you don't want. So that's me. Cool. And what should yeah. I call cog function? <laughs> <laughs> just Jay? Uh, it's, yeah, just Jay. My name is Jabot, but because some people think it's hard to pronounce, they just call me Jay. Uh, yeah, my Twitter account is cogfun, which is yeah. supposed to be fun. Yeah, I'm a professor in engineering, and uh, I used to be a systems engineer myself, and um, I've been also very interested in personality types, psychology, and I've been reading about it for about like seven years, uh, and yeah, that's it. And Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy. I'm not a YouTuber or a blogger, uh, just a person who knows Joyce and thought it would be fun to call, you know, call into an ENTP call with eight people and just see what kind of mayhem happens. I do work in human resources, which means I use MBTI to judge Boris. Yeah. You're the kind yeah. of HR person I like to deal with, you know, because normally they're the pit bulls that you have to get by so you can talk to the CEO and get the job. But I wish I had a <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm an HR person too, and I got to facilitate the MBTI in my organization. Hi, I'm Joyce, and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner. And today we're gonna have a chaotic NE time. So I'm excited that you all came out. My first question for you all is, what ENTPs do you relate to, fictional or in real life? Aha, I'm gonna say Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones. One of the things I really love about Tyrion Lannister is his uh, ability of framing. So he's always seems to be put in these situations where he's faced with options and he chooses none of the above. He creates this third option that nobody else thought of and pursues that and, and kind of leaves everyone else behind. Um, and I always think that's a lot of fun to see. Yeah. I actually doubt if he's ENTP though. 
Well, I think that's yeah. going to be the case with anybody any of us brings up. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My favorite, uh, my favorite person who is also might be an ENTP is a person called Alan Watts. Unless you are into like spiritual stuff, you wouldn't like hear hear about him. But you know, even if you like push type aside, he himself is like a, almost like a perfect type. He does almost all the functions really well. The way he articulates it too, it's really like good. He's amazing dude. Yeah. For me, it's actually been Richard Feynman. I mean, I'm. I'm I, mean, mm, I was from, gonna uh, say that. Wait, oh, hold up. <laughs> they're trying to grab him. I, I mean, I don't really care about Because I remember reading his book, Surely Your Joke, Mr. Feynman. I read that before I knew about MBTI. And so many things I could relate to. I'm saying, I did that. I created my own language and I couldn't talk to anybody. So I, it really resonated with me before I even know what MBTI was. Mm -hmm. And I do respect him because he's such a creative problem solver, yet he has an inner kid. Do you know I mean, like, remember when the whatever. Uh, challenger disaster happened. He says, oh, yeah, it's the O-rings. You know, it's just this mindset that I've always admired and arrogantly could relate to. Of course, I'm not Feynman, right? So he's a Nobel Prize winner. Since, since I was also thinking of the same person, I think I'll go next. But like, yeah, so I think it was really cool because I also read that book, The Show You're Joking, as well as his other books. But that one was my favorite. Um, it was really interesting because like, it's, it's hard to get the inner thought process um, at least in like fiction or even non creative nonfiction or whatever, you know, like it's hard to like read something with the inner thoughts of an ENTP. Like you'll see them in a show maybe, but you don't get their monologue. You don't get their full thought process. It was interesting to see because he's the one who wrote it. It was like autobiographical. Biographical. And I thought it was really cool because there were like specific little things that I related to. Like, for example, he was trying to like choose um, which school he should teach at between like Cornell and I think Princeton and he kept this decision kept coming up over and over in his life So one day he just decided he's like I will always choose Cornell I don't have a reason but I will always and like that's kind of like I relate to stuff like that You know like me sometimes like there's just the option sometimes I just choose one and I there's not necessarily any logic because they both look kind of equal So I just I don't know there were like little specific things that were really cool and it, I felt like obviously again I'm not fine when obviously he's like a genius but like it was cool to have um, some similarities like that you could actually see that no one's ever really put into words anywhere else. So I really liked that. I, I yeah, relate with Larry David. I know he's been typed several different ways, but I would definitely relate with a fictional character as Larry David. We'll take him. We'll take him. Yeah, yeah right? Larry David. <laughs> the person Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like what's consistent is people type it as him as NTP a lot, so I could see that. I think this is a good way for all of us to hear how we're typing people and to calibrate off of that. <laughs> yeah, so cool. Anyone else? My favorite, um, she's not an ENTP, I think she's an NE driver, is the character Veronica Mars. Kristen Bell was in this TV show like 15, was it like 15 years ago? So she's, she's definitely N-E-S-I polarity in that show big time. She, she gets into new situations, but then she runs back to old people throughout the show and it's just pure N-E. So I identify with her a lot. Yeah. I identify or relate to or just like uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, because he was, a, <laughs> yeah. he was a painter, good at drawing, an engineer, um, good at everything he did, and also he was always ahead of his time, yeah. and uh, he was also a good teacher. So these are things that I like about him. And when I read his quotes, uh, I relate to them and Feynman's the most. Um, so yeah, yeah. Leonardo da Vinci and Richard Feynman have been typed as ENTP like across the board, and I feel mm -hmm. like they're. Very ENTP ENTPs. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Some ENTJs are trying to get Feynman. Can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't have him. They can have other people, but they can't have him. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's a socionic things to type him as ENTJ. Yeah. Okay, there's some subtlety to that, to that argument because the JP switch is only for introverts. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. It's that's sad. true. But what I'm saying is they... Uh, socionics is so complex 
that you can play with it and justify anything with it. Mm. Yeah. You can say, okay, oh, he's doing this because this is um, his function in this position. So if he is creative, ENTJ is also creative because in socionics, everyone uses all the functions. They can justify anyone's type as any, any type. Yeah. I think all types are creative in different flavors and that's where yeah, you like catch them. Right. Like Da Vinci and uh, Richard Feynman, they are, uh, they are unique in their own flavor. But those mm -hmm. two people are like almost like godlike because it's very hard mm -hmm. to like choose a skill and then master it and then choose another one and master yeah. it. It's like you're living one person's entire life multiple times, which is so mm -hmm. crazy. If you just think about it. Yeah. Even with Richard Feynman, I'm sure he has like gone through like a math journey, a physics journey, just like, you know, processed everything. Uh, he everything also done. started drawing uh, at the end, I think. Damn. He also had an art journey, right? God. Yeah. Damn. My typing is not great whatsoever. I barely understand the functions to begin with. But I think Jim Carrey would be a ENTP. Who agrees with that? I think he's he been typed. Any. He's been typed as an NE DOM. So uh, e ENFP, ENTP, debatable, but the NE driver is there. Yeah, I would say he's. Uh, so I think he's too expressive, emotionally expressive. Uh, to be uh, ENTP. ENTPs yeah. are more like just uh, serious face, but saying funny stuff. Uh, yeah. But I think ENFPs, which ha uh, who have FI, who are more comfortable with their own feelings and more comfortable sharing them. So you see their facial expressions be more expressive when they uh, act or just talk. Yeah. That's, yeah. But you could definitely relate to, we all could definitely relate to the, his high yeah. NE, uh, yeah. energy, yeah. creativity, uh, fun loving, things like that. Yeah. 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 I relate to that, but also he's diagnosed with a lot of different mental illnesses and same thing for me. And he takes a lot of medications mm -hmm. and that really stood out to me. And it's okay with me if he's a, you know, that's okay with me. I still relate to him and love him. It's the joint NE that we care about, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, by the way, a, a quick question. Who is friend with whom outside of the this this chat? I'm so friends think, with you. Yeah, I'm friends with uh, Chad. Yeah. Yeah. Friend, me. Me. And yeah. Friend, you touched Barajos, me. And uh, <laughs> I was of course. Really so I'm confused. I was practicing so long, I messed up. Uh, yeah, I'm friends with Chad yeah. and Farah, and now all of you. Nice. Yeah, I only know uh, Joyce from here. I know all of you. I've been looking at cognitive functions, so Jay's chats for a long. I mean, his tweets on Twitter for a long time, and they're they're really solid. Like, I highly recommend following him on Twitter. I think all of you are cool. I'm going to follow you all on social media after this. Yeah. Uh huh. You, you, can. you can. I'm trying to. You remember. think we're cool now? Wait like an hour from now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I did type Jim Carrey as a ENFP, but I find like when you share the dominant function, it's really easy to relate to that person. Like there are some mm. INTJs in anime and in and possibly in real life that I, I can see commonality with too. Like in anime, there's Kiri, Giri, and from Danganronpa, and she's an INTJ, Whoa. but I, I relate to her. So that sharing the dominant function like can make the commonality there. Yeah, almost the same type. I would say ENFP and ENTP are the same. Uh, like they look for the same things, but they have different tool sets. It's like uh, their tools are different, but they are looking for the same thing, which is experiencing the world, having fun, living the life to the fullest, things like that. Yeah, Carl Jung, he initially proposed that there were eight types. And so your yeah. dominant function is what made you that type. And then you would have that slight differentiation with the middle two functions, but uh -huh. he defined the types by your dominant function, which would make sense. Yeah. with what Jay said. And and so my next question for you guys is, what makes ENTPs feel alive and energized? Mm. Talking about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about stuff that is cool. That is my most mm. basic answer. 
Yeah. I think most ENTPs have this uh, shiny object syndrome. Like I myself have like 20 projects that I would really want to do. And each one of them is like a huge skill. It's like a lifelong skill. But I want to do all of them, right? And genuinely, I feel I can pull it off. But I know I can't. Once you do the SI, you'll figure it out. You know, you can't. But the shiny object syndrome, it really feels like you're sacrificing something, some aspect of reality, you know? So it's mm. so it is what it is. Along the same uh, line, I mean, wouldn't it? for me, it's possibility and the, the prospect of experience. And I had this discussion with an INFJ. For me, an experience is it's the highest valued thing. So if I say, be, spending time with you was a great experience, they're like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but like just possibility, infinite possibility, mm. experiences. Things that, that are, are really fond memories for me, they always came about in a random way. You know, maybe, mm. uh, you know, some sort of interaction or a time away or, or some adventure started off in, in some way where I had a, a certain outcome that I, I thought might happen, but was just, you know, open to whatever, you know, wherever the wind was going to blow. And, and then all kinds of randomness happened. And that was exciting. Synchronicities. I think, yeah. I think uh, what I want to formulate what I what I really like and what energizes me. I think if I want to formulate it as an ENTP, it's uh, solving a problem and sharing the results with others. That problem could be financial. That problem could be intellectual. That problem could be uh, the in the work workplace because we have FE. And we like to share it, share good things of our lives with others and make others happy. But we are not confident enough in it to directly touch it and be directly very expressive. We find indirect ways to make other people happy and share our joy with them. So those indirect ways include, I don't know, cracking a joke, uh, solving a problem, fixing someone's, uh, I don't know, device or car or whatever fixing someone else's code or learning something and then teaching it in the best way possible and making everyone like enjoy the learning experience. So I think that's what energizes me. And even like when I think about financial goals, at the end, I want to share that money with everyone and everyone, uh, I want everyone to have fun. Uh, so I think that's what energizes me and I try to put it in a, in the ENTP framework, yeah. I wish I was one of your students. Yeah, we all want to be one of your students in your in your class. <laughs> you can be now with Zoom, but you have, yeah. I have to put you in groups and you have to do work. <laughs> no, no work, no. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of boring. Like the subjects, actually, they're not boring, but uh, they may be boring for you, but. They are more, mostly in like engineering, reliability. I'll make you like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. ENTPs are like metaphysical playmates that can make you enjoy the most boring concepts by turning them into yeah. fun. <laughs> I mean, Feynman was known for that just to plug him again, right? Mm, yeah. yeah. And if you can make something blow up along the way, all the better. True. <laughs> He helped build the bomb. That was kind of a big boom, but <laughs> you're right. So what energizes uh, others? Because I, I mean, I don't know. I, I want to say something, but is it going to be offensive? Is mm. this like I'm like I, I, you know what excites us? Well, I'm oh. I'm not like the cosplay ENTP girl. Like every time you search like ENTP female or something, it's like a cosplay girl or something, but... Uh, as a guy, seriously? As a guy, it's like, yeah. yeah. What ENTP female, and you could tell they're just like not ENTP, so yeah. you could spot it by that. Oh uh, yeah, it's uh, like the mistyping problem with INFJs, where like yeah. it's people who talk about their emotions 24-7, my emotions, they hurt so much, and then they're like, I'm INFJ. And I'm like, yeah. INFJs don't have that vibe, <laughs> they wouldn't be talking about themselves the whole yeah. time. <laughs> but there are so many right. yeah out there but good point yeah like you'll, you'll google something about your type and then you'll get something completely opposite
It's like if you Google a dolphin, but it actually is talking about someone with like seven wings and you're like, wait, dolphins don't have seven wings. And, hmm. and, and so sometimes with type descriptions, you'll read it and you won't relate to it because someone is spreading misinformation and then people are ma mass perpetuating misinformation. So that's a great mm -hmm. point you brought up, Farah. And if you, you, you want to hear the most recent misinformations, follow my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, yeah, his, his tweets are Thank really you. good. Yeah, he's probably one of the center figures in type Twitter, like people. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't think so. I think people have kicked me out of the right type community. Have you been censored yet, like certain orange cats from down south? What is it? Okay, well, no. Trump was censored by Twitter, right? I just wonder uh -huh. if that happened to you as well or not. It may happen. Shout sure, everyone. <laughs> yeah. We all blocked him, but we didn't tell him. <laughs> is that the problem with ENTPs? Like they'll say something like NE is just a speculation at that moment and TI it has like some offensiveness and then like they have people like backlashing them. <laughs> mm. Or you don't even mean for something to come out offensive and you still get attacked for it. Oh, I always time. bring this up. Like ENTPs, we usually, not always, and a lot of times we don't, but like a lot of times we do have good intentions or neutral intentions but i think mm -hmm. a big part of it is just that like ti is like hey here's the truth and i don't really care if you are in a good space to take it or not and we kind of just give it to them because to us it'd be a gift like thank you you know if we give it to someone else they're like bro what the hell and then you know we're and like then, and then yeah. we have enough fe to notice that they are offended and then we have to feel bad <laughs> but we didn't have but enough it to happens not afterwards yeah, yeah exactly so i mean we have to get into the me like that. Sometimes it'll only be like one word. Like I'll yeah. say something and it was like a word choice or something. And then I see the person's face. They're like, oh my God, why did you say that? I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> like, yeah. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, their eyes get wide and you're like, oh no, I said something. <laughs> F E kicked in. <laughs> so. In our defense, there are some people, it does not matter how attackful you will be, they will just be offended that you said something vaguely true. And for the most part, I'm a tactful communicator, but I, as an ENTP, sometimes I slip up like, because what I say to somebody else, I personally wouldn't be offended by. So I'm not always taking into account that this could possibly damage rapport with a person. And um, in most cases in life, I could give a shit less if someone's offended or if I damage the rapport. I'm just like, okay, good. I won't be around you anyway. And that's why I don't really care for having friends anyway. But I, I still, even though I have this problem, I still find it useful to try to be as tactful as I can. I just wanted to give a fair defense that there are some people that not matter how tactful you are. Fair defense for us. Okay, adding to Chad's point, I think the biggest mistake I think at least most people do is we try to help people who don't want to help themselves. And every time you do that, no matter how much, how good of information you have, even if you have like the holy grail with you, if the person is not willing to help themselves, you're, you're just losing a losing battle, you know? You're just fighting a losing battle. So the, the, the person not only hates you now, but also, you know, you lost any chance of giving the information in a correct state of mind, which would have helped them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, it's like a lose-lose situation. Yeah, yeah and that's... something that could help us, help us, uh, mm -hmm. not... Uh, fall into that trap is to clarify before we give some analysis to other people that mm -hmm. these are just analysis just thoughts maybe my information is not enough and maybe it's not accurate maybe it's not correct i'm just giving them to you they may be useful to you and mm -hmm. they does it, because i say them it's not uh, necessarily true or precise or correct um so i'm just like a computer that that gives you some information and it could be wrong just so don't take it like super seriously and that's not how i feel about you for example if i tell you you're uh, being selfish or all of your problems in your life are because you're not responsible it's just because it's based on the amount of information that i have now and that's just the um, analysis of the situation it's not how i feel about you i love you i don't uh, i don't hate you because you're not responsible or anything. I'm just giving you some information. So, 
yeah, clarifying this before saying that, uh, before giving, providing with them with the analysis, I think helps. If we, last week, actually, I was, uh, one of my relatives had a fight with his wife and they wanted me to listen to both and see uh, what's going on. So I was listening very objectively. And at the end, uh, I told her wife that, oh, I think you are very selfish. That's why you have problems. And oh. then a, a, a <laughs> big fight <laughs> just started. Yeah. And I said, oh, what did I say? I didn't mean you're selfish. I meant like you like yourself. Like I couldn't fix it. It was too late. Uh, you like, you <laughs> like salt and you like fish, you know? <laughs> you yes. like fish. That's good. <laughs> I should have said that. Yeah, it was too late. Sometimes, sometimes we can give people too much information. That's something yes. I've recognized. I'm like, oh, what is that? Yeah. So people will ask for my opinion. I'm like, okay, let me just tell you everything that I think because more information is better, right? And like, can you go back to the first thing you said? I'm like, I'm out. Yeah. So I want to respond to that. I think that like the beauty of having friends with other high stack end users is that we don't have to be so tactful and like filter through the things we say. Yes. I find that in like everyday life, I have to tread carefully, you know, because I don't want to actually offend. Mm -hmm. And at this point in my life, I think I've developed enough FE to you know be like smart about it read the room but like you know like it's there's something really beautiful about not having to think about that like with my intp best friends or like mm. my enfp or entp friends like i think it's just like there's like a joy that comes with being able to just unleash your ne without being worried that you might accidentally offend someone and you don't even know this i like i guess they're both aspects to it what helps like with, with the people i talk and my clients and stuff the, the, I think the biggest mistake I did in my past is, especially with FE, you can easily correct this, is people give what they have, you know, but that's not what you're supposed to do. You give what the other person needs. And it doesn't even matter whether you have what they need or not. They need to know that you have what they need. And for that, you have to first listen, build rapport, and think, okay, you know what? I understand exactly what your situation is. This is what you're feeling. Is this what you're exactly going through? And this is where mm. like FE comes, we exactly know. And then we tell, you know, Two nuggets, like what Morgan said, you can only tell two things, two short things, so it better be good. So we have to like dumb everything down to like two things, very short things, because they don't remember more than that. <laughs> I think, I think so it's, it's different like, from like a, like if you're teaching someone or they're your client compared yeah. to like, I think in like friendship relationships, sometimes it's hard for, even if you keep creating a space for someone else, sometimes you don't get it yeah. back. And it's harder for us to ask for it, in my opinion, with like our mm. fuller FI. And like, cause we maybe even don't feel like we need it and we don't notice until mm. we're kind of upset and we don't know why. And we're like, yeah. oh, it's because they never let us have space to express our TI or our emotions or our thoughts, you know, or whatever. So I don't know. Well, I think one of the gifts uh, we bring to the world is actually our honesty and something that I've recognized after like past decade is just because I give people honesty doesn't mean I'm actually going to get it back, <laughs> which is yeah. actually really hurtful too. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. TI is known as radical honesty and to parallel it with FI, FI is known as radical authenticity. So there's that parallel. And so TI is really good at being like honest and giving like the, the truth. It's impartial truth. So when they hand it over to you, uh, when you emotionally react, it's strange because the, it's kind of like it was impersonal information and then it's being made personal by the person receiving it. <laughs> you said something interesting. You mentioned FI and TI. I find out of all the juxtaposing functions, for me, FI is the most challenging and I find the TI-FI divide is really hard to bridge. Like I yeah. did accidentally yeah. three INFPs in a row. It was, it's always the same clash. TI and FI, especially... Yeah. FI is excited about something, you cannot reason with FI. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Something Antonia Dodge says about the TI and FI friendship is that they get along until the TI user offends the FI user, and, and then it, it then it goes, woo, self. <laughs> you say, and, but, but something very interesting for us, very useful for us, when you argue with an a, a FI user, I think we again, fall in, in the trap of uh, explaining everything, <laughs> rationalizing everything. This is why I'm making this decision. This is why I like you. This is why I don't like that person. We give all these reasons, but they, they are worthless to them. But what we can do, which is a shortcut, and 
uh, works really fast is to connect to our own feelings and say, I don't want to move to that place just because I don't like it. That's it. Instead of explaining so many different things, I would just say, I don't like it. I don't want to do it because I don't like it. I don't feel good doing it. And that's enough for them. The problem starts when we try to rationalize and explain and analyze why we want to do something, but we avoid telling the truth, which is in this case is the truth is our genuine feeling. I don't want to do this because I don't like it. That's it. Mm. I mean, I yeah. think it's really, also hard. Don't, for us. don't you Go find, ahead. Jay, that you have a, a reason for it? I mean, if, if I don't like something, I can always give you a reason, and it doesn't feel like any kind of rationalization to me. It's a reason, and and, and I'm happy to stand. Yeah, on. but yeah, I'm talking about how to explain it to a FI user. Yeah, we yeah, can yeah, even, even still. But even they still. don't. They don't uh, get the reasoning. They are waiting for the the terminology is different. When when you say I just don't like it. They understand it better. Uh, compared yeah. to give like and, 10 and I guess in that way, I'm not as attached to like I don't feel like they need to agree with me from that point of view. So I'm I'm okay if somebody sometimes with me. Uh, sometimes we do care because we have if we want to have harmony with that person, and uh, because of that, we end up saying things which aren't actually true from an emotional standpoint in some situations. So sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you are not that close to that person, we just don't care about it. And we say the truth, tell the truth, they get offended, we don't care, they leave, and we don't care. But sometimes, in some situations, it's not that easy. We, well, are, we I have so the FE as being something of being able to come to a, you know, an agree to disagree, but we, we don't need to have the same opinion on this, but I can, I can still respect you as a person and back away. In my experience, they don't like, they don't, so FI users do, do not like things that sound nice but aren't genuine. FI users like things that are honest, which means if you, if you look into their eyes and say, hey, I don't like you, they like that more than when you tell them, hey, I like you so much, you're such a good person, but deep down you actually don't I'm like them. I'm not suggesting that at all. So, so what if you look no, into their eyes and just, say, I like that you? That was just an example. Uh, I didn't... Okay. Yeah. Sometimes TI users, when they're saying like, like they don't care, it's it's because like TI has sometimes an apathy problem. When Jay was saying to tell the FI user, I don't care, how I saw it was a TI apathy. Yeah, when you say I don't care, you're basically saying that I don't have enough energy to deal with this. So yeah. <laughs> I'd rather be a little, I'd rather be a little yeah. sad and leave uh, you know what? than... The FI user may not understand that in the moment. And I find, I used to call it, I mean, this was people I dated, I said, let's hug it out. Because you cannot, do not try to argue with FI. Yes. You have to hug it out, you have to validate them saying, I understand, <laughs> this is what will happen, this is how you saw it, this is how you feel about it. Let's hug it out. But long term, that can get really frustrating because there are some things that TI needs. If something does not make sense, you want to be able to utter it. And in general, I think ENTPs, I don't, I seek the truth. I don't believe I know the truth. Anything I say is my best right. current interpretation of the truth. So don't be offended. I'm, I'm not claiming that what I say is right. I'm just giving you my honest, authentic, best guess of what's going on but an fi user if you if you step under one of the red buttons that's it <laughs> yeah. mean, how many uh, fi users have yeah. you dated? i've dated three infps uh, in sequence it was also the same thing the sequence. NP is shared are you okay you. Really <laughs> <laughs> are you okay it's always yeah. the same pattern and he gets us together and then ti and fi Make it, you can amicably separate, but it is, there's some things that I find hard to bridge with an FI DOM. They have to uh, uh, it, but it's funny. Yeah, That's so I find true. I have like an uh, animalistic just attraction towards FI users, animalistically. But after like 10 minutes, I'm like, yo, this is just a waste of my time, you know? I don't want to like talk about insects, birds and stuff. I just want to like talk about reality, truth, and you know, it's just... It is what it is. So, what what do you guys appreciate about FI? What do you appreciate about FI users? Authenticity. They can help you with your feelings. I appreciate. Uh, it's like when an when an FI user like masters a skill, 
let's say any artistic skill let's say painting drawing or whatever yeah. and they express themselves through that that is really beautiful that is like you know that like makes my jaw drop it's like wow mm. how did you even come up with this let me ask it this way what advantages do you think fi doms have uh, compared to us setting boundaries yeah. i would say because uh, when i set boundaries as a ti user you you you, you cannot just say i don't like it but fi user just say i don't like this but when i say i don't like this i feel i want to give reasons why and if i do not give reasons why i feel like i can get called out you know or oh, damn this guy is going to ask me why i don't like this now i have to like, give my reasons but if i users don't have that fear i don't like this cat i don't like this cat you know there's nothing to it but for me it's like it's like i have my reason but i don't want to tell it yeah i think as a ti user it's hard to justify you don't have logic like for example if i actually don't like someone but i can't think of good logical reasons then i will keep hanging out with them because i can't justify logically why i should it unless i come up with something but like you know the the real thing was just like i don't know i just don't vibe with them but like what kind of ti yeah, reason that it's not it's like it's more emotional. and honestly i don't think i don't really dislike anyone like i'm not sure my feelings are not that deep about people that i don't like like i yeah. i don't process it so i don't process negative feelings well so i don't accumulate a deep negative feeling towards anyone hmm. so because of that i actually get hurt a lot from people who mm-hmm. i must hate but i don't so i it's a little bit of negativity when i see them laughing uh, smiling to my face i forget that little bit then they hurt me again on the, on the same spot um uh, right yeah so i think um uh, that's our own flaw that we mm. cannot uh mm, develop negative feelings towards uh some people or some things and because of that we get hurt from those places a lot when I mean, you when you yeah. feel so negative about something or someone you avoid them so it's some sort of protecting yourself or setting boundaries but I, like you said uh but i think we don't have that luxury Yeah. <laughs> the, what's funny is I was doing this survey in uh, my Discord server, and most of the people in my server is like are like TEFI users, right? And I was like asking them, so like, let's talk about which type is you know kind of have like a hate. Which type do you hate? You know, like ooh. So I think <laughs> <laughs> majority ooh. wise, <laughs> majority <laughs> wise, everyone just said the people that no one really likes, even me, is the people who have like immovable. ti or fi if a person is not willing to listen and mm-hmm. it doesn't matter whether you have ti or fi you are just not open enough and say no 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 this is this is right you know no j you're wrong you are wrong j and and, and you mm-hmm. know that what like triggers everyone i find if you have like an immobile ti or di you know this is how the world is and you agree with me right you agree with me right i mm-hmm. hate it when people use me to validate their world view In like, my experience, yo, it's always been like more of like the masculine JI functions, you know, like masculine mm. JI, masculine FI. In my opinion, is a little mm. harder to uh, talk to in the moment. Like, obviously, if you step away from the situation, you can always talk it out with anyone. In my opinion, but like in the moment, for me at least, I found that I clash the most with like even masculine TI. Like, because I have found that TI is harder for me to uh, disagree. I guess it's harder. Mm. Makes but, sense. So that brings us to our next question. What are ENTP strengths? Possibilities thinking, adaptability, mm. creativity, resourcefulness, and being rather mm-hmm. chill and detached in crisis situations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I find any users just like any TI users being really good at including me I see it in myself too. It's like pattern recognition and making that patterns into a logical framework. that you can like pass on to others i think that is like really powerful like i feel like if i if i if i got into music theory right give me like 10 years i'll figure that stuff out it's it's not that hard i can see the patterns just have to see the recurring patterns if i consume enough i will see the patterns you know same goes to the spirituality too it's like you, it's very easy to recognize patterns and not just recognize that but also make a framework from it through which you're like you know you can operate through that i think that is like a super power compared to other types i think a healthy entp uh, has the advantage of 
seeing something good or valuable either in other people or in a situation and mm -hmm. not being distracted by what other people say about that and keep going until they realize it. Um, so I think that that's a, being resilient, I guess, and, and seeing a good, the good side of everything. So if, I'm, if I have to stay in this place, I rather think about the positives and I can be, I can make myself happy in any situation. So uh, that and uh, yeah, being creative, I think is common things that everyone mentioned, yeah. Yeah, and I guess it's that maybe dominant NE and inferior SI. So the inferior SI is like it won't take your SI word for like how like it's traditionally viewed or and it like NE is like I'll I'll figure it out like mm -hmm. in my own terms. And, and so it makes the most out of that with its own. And, and TI, may, TI helps us have um, realistic solutions. It's not like mm -hmm. just hopes and wishes. We actually make uh, a solution, create a solution that uh, has the right mechanism to solve that problem, to reach that vision that we have. Uh, and so to I do think it that that's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, we, like we, I think the kind yeah. of thing rather than a just a solution for right now, but to be a universal mm -hmm. solution. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that works anytime in every situation. That's great. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, TI is good at finding the universal, like, truth, the universal organizing principle, and, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. I think TI has this advantage that it doesn't get derailed by false information, because you're consuming from so many different sources. You, you mm -hmm. Even if, like, some one person is lying, you're, you don't just get, oh, my God, you know, you don't, like, get derailed from, because you're doing that internal logic thingy, you're, like, deriving everything, like, from scratch, so that really helps. Yeah, TI builds from the ground up, so it, it, it's it's understanding logic in its own way. So it has to like make sense from how you're building it from the ground up, which gives it a type of creativity and flexibility and type of original logic that they make because it's like something that it originates from from them. I think the JI functions build their own opinion from the ground up and it allows for some sort of individuality in, in either thinking for TI or with FI it's feeling. Mm -hmm. I, know, I think TI because TI <clears throat> ideally uses con logical consistency as a measure of appropriateness where I find FI is I like this I don't like that and that's why I find FI challenging. I do enjoy the company of FI folks but I'm very aware that <laughs> So that's actually the difference between FI and, uh, in my view, FI and FE. FE users, especially ENTPs, ESTPs, who don't have a strong FI, they think, we think, as long as we are, like, just happy together around each other, that's, that means we have a strong feelings towards each other. But FI users, um, if our users see relationships, relationships as something way deeper and more challenging and more interesting, which has so much depth and uh, aspects to it. For example, it, it, it involves pain, it involves sacrifice, it involves a lot of different things that come with a relationship. And when we say, oh, we're just friends, I just like you, you like me, and that's it. It's like we are uh, simplifying the human relationship too much in their view, mm. and that's why, um, and I think they are right. We are right too, but our connections are not really that deep. We have, I, and, I and also, we don't know, I'm sorry, uh, we don't know which one of our relationships are the most valuable. So we don't keep nurturing and uh, maintaining those relationships so well. We spend our energy in so many different directions that we sometimes lose some of the very good relationships that we have, especially in our family, uh, by wasting our time with, on so many different things. So uh, I think the most important thing for us ENTPs is, uh, uh, is to understand and appreciate FI and uh, uh, develop it in ourselves by practicing, just practicing and observing people who are good users of that. And one last thing, I think one of our strengths, which comes from 
very weak or uh, blind FI is that we do not take ourselves ourselves seriously and we do not feel ashamed for being stupid and uh, we don't care how other people think about us when we f try something and fail and that gives us a lot of new opportunities we can try so many different things because we are not afraid of looking dumb uh, so we go through we are able to go through many different paths and um, come up with so many different things and develop ourselves in so many different dimensions. Yeah, sorry I interrupted you, Wendy. That's okay. I think one of the uh, one of the big things people don't quite get is just how private ENTPs are. Um, we're because we do put a lot out, um, and there's a lot to bounce off of. People think that they're they're seeing a certain thing, and there's actually you know there's a reluctance on our part to show vulnerability. Um, but there's actually, you know, we're more private than, than I think we let on. And, and the FI people might even misinterpret that or want to go digging and we're reluctant to go there. Um, so I, I think that's comment. part of the FI, um, the FI clash as well. I think for me, at least, I think I've heard this from other ENTPs too. It's like we give, we share a lot of things to the point where it seems like as though we've opened up, but we only share things that like we don't really care about. Like I might share something that seems really intimate, but like I literally don't care about it. So the person mm. might think we're really close, exactly. but I, you know, they don't, they don't know me, but like I gave them <laughs> enough so they think. <laughs> and like, I don't know, I might be the youngest one here. So maybe I'm like, no, that was there. awesome. That was no, so yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, like I mean, true. it's like it's like something that other people might consider like deep and intimate. But for me, I was like, I'm just sharing. And now you think we're close, so hey, like it works for me. Sure. Like, <laughs> even though you don't know much about me, but yeah. <laughs> it, I wonder if it's like an extrovert charm thing, because it, it's true. I, I've also had my ENFP friend talk about that before too, and it's like how I'll like she'll say she'll say things and people will feel close to her but like she hasn't really shared anything actually about herself so i think like sometimes extroverts they frame closeness with people because they can look like an open book but they're really not being one <laughs> i read a thing that like entps at least like when you see them in public or whatever you think you know a lot about them and then you see them in private and then you feel even more disconnected from them just because like it was kind of a facade but also like I don't, I don't bring any room into this, I guess. I'm a three, so at, I'm... At the same time, it's not inauthentic either. You know, what we're mm. doing yeah, is not, not inauthentic. It's, it's so, just a so different frame. I've had FI people say, well, that's a face that you're putting on. Well, no, it's not. It's just another aspect of me. Yeah. I'm just it's, choosing yeah. how yes. much, speaking to the comment about boundaries earlier, I've right. got some pretty good boundaries, you know, and I know how much I want uh, to say, you know, as part, part of my public face. That's very true. Yeah. And sometimes we honestly don't know how we feel about so many different things. So the reason we don't share our feelings about certain things is because we haven't processed them first ourselves. So we're not really sure about how we feel about things. So it's not and, because and maybe it's don't not have that, a need to make a decision on them. Like we yes, um, we're okay. To I want to be just oh, I want a lot of things in my life. I just want them to be open ended, and I don't want to have a attached to a certain. Okay view or anything. I just want everything to be open. There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, something interesting yeah. to Jay's point though, when he said, well, he doesn't, he's not aware of close relationships and made me so. I personally somewhat disagree because I really, I'm very aware. I have very few good friends. I cherish them and I, I'm very aware of delineating who is inside, who's outside. Now, I don't mind that mm. many people out there are we best buddies? I'm like, yeah, well, we are and we're not. But I think I'm very aware and try to maintain the four or five close relationships I have. Now, that might have come mm. with age and time, but I'm very... Yeah, I'm, I'm personally becoming much, much better at this. And uh, I've, I spend a lot of energy for maintaining the good relationships that I have already. It's because I've become aware of it through different experiences. But you're right. Uh, um, mm. I wanted to ask this for everyone. So, so do you guys play the FE cookie game? And what I mean by this is, it's like you are aware of what you put out is what you get back, right? So, so you kind of like have like this mental calculation where, okay, I did this much good things to this much person. So it's like you know, uh, so it's like if I give a criticism, 
it's like they won't like cut me off immediately because I've already done so much good things. So, so they'll kind of take it. But if you like really, really give like a really harsh criticism and then all the cookies like deplete and you give one more, one more like a harsh criticism, you're going negative, right? So now we lost a relationship. So do you guys have like this kind of like PI cookie game kind of structure? So is that like a brownie points? It's like reciprocation. Yes, brownie like, points. Yeah. yeah, like sometimes FE knows there's a give and take with with, with emotions, and that like if, if you want to mm. like deliver a TI truth, you gotta ha- ha- like stack up some goodwill before you do it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I always talk yeah. about like this triangle of vulnerability or whatever, where like first there's like the baseline of positive interactions. You need positive interactions first. And then the second tier is you need frequency. So you need enough positive interactions and then you could give criticism or you could be vulnerable or you could share your problems. You can't just mm-hmm. unload and dump your problems on someone over and over without having the positive um, interactions enough times, you know, frequency. Because then, mm-hmm. you know, you become a leech or, you know, it wasn't the right yeah. time for you to share it. So I think that I agree with that. The problem that I come into contact with is sometimes you think that you built up all these brownie points or these cookies mm-hmm. or whatever, but then you do one thing and then it's like they forgot yeah. everything else that's happened in the past. Yeah. That's when it's hard for my TI to process it. But then again, I have to realize that not everyone works yeah. in the same framework as me, but you know. Uh, yeah, I can see that. And that's a really good concept. And it's kind of like FE, it, it kind of like knows what you need to build an appropriate relationship. So it, it's like, well, th- there are all these times where I added to the relationship and then like now like they're not they're not reciprocating yeah so like a, a good word for fe is it understands reciprocation in, in relationships and it can be devastated mm. when there's not that yeah so, I, I came with like i came up with like three it's like you know it's in giving that you receive but you need to like you need it, that giving needs to satisfy three conditions really quick the so first condition is it needs to be unconditional so you cannot give and say, oh, I gave you this. Now you need to like give me this. You cannot do that, right? Unconditional. Give unconditionally. Second condition is you need to give without expecting any outcome. The, the moment you expect any outcome, that, that's like a leech in your head and that's like starts draining you, right? So if you're giving, give from a place of abundance. And the third point, which I like mentioned before, which is the point that no one, everyone misses, is that you have to give what the other person needs and what you and not what you have. Everyone just gives what I have. Oh, hi, I have TI. Let me just give you TI. No, I need FI. No, let me give you TI. That's because that's what point. you need. So it's like, you know, you don't do that. And once you like just follow these three conditions, it should be golden. That's an amazing, amazing thought, Prem. And it reminds me of the golden rule versus the platinum rule. So the golden rule is treat others the way you want to be treated. But what mm. Prem is saying here is to use the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they want to be treated. It's like not to give them what you have, but to give them what they need. So that's mm. a really great way of looking at it. Great, great, TI. I think, I think Ian, these are actually very good at identifying what makes someone happy and what help someone. So yeah. I think we are actually good at it. It's like solving a problem. We see someone sad and we see that as a problem to make them happy. And we start analyzing them, their lives, um, everything about them. And then we give them a solution. And they were like, wow, this was what I just needed. How did you come up with this? Um, so I think we're good at that from an engineering that's true. Yeah, yeah. TI always comes with FE and FE is all about social outcomes. So it's like creating an environment or like understanding, analyzing what it what it takes to create good FE social outcomes. And also, I think also, I think FE users are weak at um, FE users basically relate to everything. So we read something, we're like, oh, that's me. And <laughs> That com- causes a problem when we read, for example, about um, how people uh, do things because they expect something in return. We think we are like that too, because we basically relate to a, a lot of things. Uh, but I think uh, FE users don't give with an expectation. They give um, for, for Having a positive community, they just want to have a consistent, long-term, good connection with other people. And yeah. it doesn't mean that when we give something to someone, we expect mm-hmm. something in return. We actually 
we just give things, we just, we sometimes give too much to just keep the harmony going. And um, mm -hmm. I think we shouldn't confuse that with, and, yeah. with expectation. For, because That's I thought true. for a long time that I, I have expectations when I give things to people, but then I just started like watching myself and I realized I don't really actually, I don't even remember what I did for other people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, yeah. Our main yeah. expectation is just having a good, yeah. positive relationship with other people. And uh, yeah, that's a that's good it. point. You mentioned Jay about how like FE is kind of a social chameleon. So it might not yeah. know if it actually identifies with something. I would say some FI users who are type nine in the Enneagram would also had to have a difficulty with maybe understanding themselves too, but for a different reason. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so you mentioned a good point about how like, like FE, it just wants like a harmonious type of community because FE is naturally more interdependent than FI is. And mm. it, it just wants to see that everyone's values getting along, if that makes yes. sense. Yes, and sometimes and, because the other person is not satisfied with everything that you do, you keep doing and you keep doing and you don't get that harmony back. And then you think that you have this expectation but you really don't. You, all you have, all you need is that harmony. And that in those moments, it's just best to step back and not have this constant need to be in a good relationship with everyone. It's okay to be disconnected from some people. It's actually respecting their uh, individuality and their privacy to just leave them alone sometimes and not expect a positive feedback from them. I think positive feedback, I mean positive, uh, harmonious relationship. Part of, uh, you know, maturing FE for ENTPs is getting away from looking to other people for validation and moving toward being more sort of community altruistic, um, meaning yeah. that you're looking for good outcomes for all of your people within your communities um, rather than, yeah, just looking for that validation. I think every function is like a tool. And uh, it's like, let's, take, let's say if he's a hammer, right? So you you see your nail, you use a hammer, right? You don't use a chainsaw. I mean, you can get things done, but use a hammer, right? But but when you're using a hammer, it really comes down to the intention of the person who's using the hammer. You can like kill people with it, or you can like build a beautiful house with it. I see FE as like a tool, you know, and it really comes down to the intention of the user to like determine how how they should use the tool. You could use it to like build stuff. You could use it to create amazing communities. You could, you could, there's so many ways you can use it. But I think, I think all this stuff comes down to like mindset. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, you just have like a growth mindset. I think that's the key. Mm. It's yeah, that, that's a really interesting thought. We talked about feedback and FE. I noticed that with some FE users, when there's no positive feedback coming from their relationships, it, it's noticeable, like it's it's very noticeable to that FE. And, and so you can take it in two ways. You, you, you can try to like garner positive feedback because you notice that gap or it's like taking in that altruistic way that Wendy was talking about. Yeah, to FE, I mean, it comes, I think like any function in mature and not so mature version, criticism of, I, I was hard on FI earlier. FE can be, especially with arms like ENFJs or even ENTPs can be extremely insincere. Like I, I can smell that somebody's placating me just to tell me what I what they think I want to hear. And as an ENTP, that's why I like maybe INFPs. They are being authentic, not because they choose, they cannot not be authentic. Where some e e FE users, they placate you and I think, aren't we beyond that? I mean, tell me what you think and what you feel. You're a close friend of mine. Don't give me this obvious placation, which I think FE users are prone to. At least ENFJs, I've encountered that. No, but there is a there is an error I've, um, I've there uh, there is a mistake I've observed uh, if FI dumbs um, make, which is sometimes they idealize you, so they think you're so good that everything you do is great. So when when they are in that phase, uh, I think when they're in that phase, it's not good for us because it encourages us to continue our not so good uh, behaviors. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think I may have maybe not well communicated. My, my main focus was 
highlighting an aspect of FE, which I think can be a tendency to placate. Yes. Which which I oft have seen in EOI and FJs, and it kind of annoys me. And I was just juxtaposing that to FI users are not that way. Of course, they have other issues. I was just trying to point out FE can mm -hmm. take, and we are good enough at picking it up where we're saying, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, go, go lunch, I don't. I don't need to hear that. Well, the thing, <laughs> then they feel the urge to placate, and I think that's something to be mindful of if you're EOI and FJ that don't do that to people they're close to because it serves no purpose. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Joyce. Yeah. You're, <laughs> you're actually you're a switch, so you might not you might not be a, an FE as high an FE user as as people might presume. What do you think? GI versus FE, you, I, I totally placate. I, I see that people sometimes can't take, can't take the truth. So mm. it's easier I want the truth. to placate. <laughs> so again, it's important to know your audience. Right? Like, like placating, yeah. placating can be an FE thing, but it can also be a defen defense mechanism on people who are highly triggered so I think it can either come from a, a genuine, like sometimes FE users just placate because they're FE, but sometimes people placate because they're around people who make them feel like they have to walk in eggshells. And so they just smooth over what they say. So then they won't get triggered around them. <laughs> For me, it's a double standard. I'm saying if you're a close friend of mine, I'm not freaking up. I'm saying, you know me well enough. Tell me what's on your mind. <laughs> yeah. Whereas with the general public, I think I do the same. I mean, I think having FE and TI next to each other really helps you to social engineer, even at a workplace, kind of schmooze, say the right thing to the right person. That is at some level placating, but I have the delineation. If you're inside my inner core, don't do that. It's just, <laughs> yeah. whereas in the world you have to do it, right? I mean, being able to lie is one of the critical skills you need to pick up by the time you're three or you have issues in later life. I wouldn't say it's a lie. It's just not true yet, you know? <laughs> Like that. <laughs> That's how we sleep at night, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so that brings us to our next question. ENTP weaknesses. Anyone want to start off? I think Jay already touched on the fact that we have a hard time identifying our feelings. Um, and this is something that I think FI users don't really understand. You know, if they ask us, like, how are you feeling today? Or how do you feel about this? And I don't always know, or maybe I'm not comfortable sharing my emotions. And so it's okay to say like, you know what, I'm not really sure right now, because I don't really <laughs> care that much about it. And so that is very, FI users are so confused by that. They're like, how do you not know how you're feeling? Is this some kind of a manipulation? That's like, no, I actually just don't really know, but give me some time and space. And so um, again, there, there comes that FI like TI communication. Yeah, or sometimes we don't know our feelings, which could be uh feeling pressured or anxiety from too many things to do too many deadlines we have so much pressure on ourselves so we feel stressed out we do not spend enough time uh, figuring out what what is it exactly that's uh, making us anxious and we then may become critical of other people like the people who are very close to us you may become, hey, why didn't you do this? Like being in a bad mood and not knowing why. So why not going to your room, uh, thinking five minutes, what is it that's giving you a stress right now? And go do that. Once you do that, come back happy. So, so I think um, it's not that difficult, difficult to connect to our feelings. We just have to practice it and spend some little, little times every day to see what are our priorities that are um, what are our main feelings main priorities and then work on them I think that's helps us for this weakness and uh, yeah and yes. not being good at details of course paperwork SI. things like that yeah SI. yeah <laughs> not not eating the right stuff if you're living alone not uh, eating enough or eating too much, uh, not knowing when to stop some things. Yeah, I think these are all inferior aside. Mm. It seems like the themes are inconsistent routines, um, yes. a trouble with emotional identification. And I'd say another mm. one is ENTPs tend to like 
think of more ideas than they follow through with. So sometimes yeah, that could be a specific thing too. And accidentally offending people. Um, and so the reason why I ask questions again, even though like they've probably already answered it before, is because I, I have this concept, like this own personal philosophy of squeezing the lemon so the lemon juice is completely out. So it's like, okay, we have some of the lemon juice with the other questions, but I'm wondering if I ask like this targeted mm. question, if you'll be able to like come up with one more idea that links it all and I together. Sorry, and I, <laughs> I, I, I think the I think the the reason why we are getting all these problems and, and the thing that I'm really working on and I think no one like really like concentrates on is creating a powerful vision that is values driven, you know? Most of the vision might be logical driven. Oh, because this, 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 I shall, I will do this in life. But logic changes, you know, over time. So the vision, vision also keeps changing. So the the picture that you're going towards is really blurry. But once you do have a, a powerful vision that is driven with your heart and not with your mind, you can use that as a filter to, you know, what I want to be a really creative person to end suffering. That's what I'm choosing in this lifetime. So you know, uh, leave all the math stuff, no physics, maybe MBTI, maybe art, creative. So I can use that to like express myself, express suffering. But so you can use the vision as a filter to see the picture clear. Because if you don't go to the end, then you'll never like see the gold, right? Because there's gold in every path that you choose. The, the only thing is, are you going to like walk the entire way or not? That is such a good point, Prem, and it reminds me of, okay, so objective personality has this concept that any and SE are channel changing, so they change from topic and topic quickly, and like NI and SI, they like to flesh out a chapter, so they're chapter changing, and then they're slower with that. And I realized that when Prem said that, NE users chapter change with the vision of their life. So sometimes because like they're, they lead with a perception function that is about variety, and about like NE seeing all the possibilities, it causes them to channel change the many paths that their life might be going on. So like, oh, you know, one day I'm doing this, the other day I'm doing this, the other day I'm doing this. People with OE, so, or like PE, so like NE or SE, struggle with like channel changing in, in the form of their interests or the form of what they're doing in their life. Just not all, but like, if you were to have a statistical trend of people of that type, that might be a problem that they have because of that. But it could be a problem or a strength, I think. I mean, on the one hand, it could be a problem if, um, again, if you're not following through, but if you can really work at the following through part to be a serial channel changer, you know, yes. to, to be on one channel and then change to the next channel, once you've come to some kind of conclusion there, that can actually really be a strength, I think. It's true, Something yeah, I'm they say- to do myself. Yeah, it's like, it's true. Your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Or like they say that it's the same coin. So being a serial channel changer can be a strength. Like you have so many like mm. interests and so many things that you know about that you're able to hone that to create something like beautiful with it. Or on the other side, it can cause like massive indecision or this scatteredness. So your greatest sword can be pointed at you or pointed at like to be the best sword ever. <laughs> I think a lot of people have a tendency to think that ENTPs are flighty, you know, we can't commit, but, and it looks like we're doing the channel changing and it's like, there's no rhyme or reason, but there is a rhyme and there's a reason for everything. And a smart ENTP is going to take all of our experiences throughout our life and we are going to take the knowledge that we learned from those experiences and we're going to just like infuse our life with this knowledge. And so that's... So other people will see it as flighty, but to me, it's like, no, I, I learned this, that, and the other thing from that experience, and I'll, I'll continue to do so over the course of my life. Yeah, something that, you know, people with NE or SE are great at is gathering transferable skills. So what transferable skills are, like, you get something from one discipline and you apply it to another discipline. So the the mastery of, like, NE or SE is, like, using the things that you get from other places in a new place. And that's like a massive superpower. And it is so, so, so powerful. Nice to see you again. <laughs> I, I, I can touch back up. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And so we can go through ENTP stereotypes. Like what is inaccurate about your type that you see spread often? Debater. Yep. Hands down. A troll. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, you know what's funny? Funny story here. We are trolls actually sometimes. sometimes. In a good way though. You know, so I, I, so I'm like talking to this woman, right? And she's talking about her friend. Oh, I think my friend is an ENTP. I'm like, oh, really? Why do you think that? Uh, so I think he he first sent me like a very insecure meme, and he started making fun of himself with every image that he sends. So I think that's that's a very ENTP thing to do, right? I'm like, yes, yes, it is. I'm never talking to you again, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I think a lot of the ENTP stereotypes are like an ENTP with really bad FE who's in junior high. That's what they're describing. Because I think we've all been the stereotype, but we're not anymore. Like yeah. I don't like the stereotypes for ENTPs. I don't really hear like that they're successful or that whatever. It's just like oh, they can't cope in like an office, or they can't do this, or they you know. It's just like it's it's hard to get like a non junior high version of an ENTP. Like and I think blog. that's why the Enne that's the advantage of uh, Enneagram because Enneagram tells you about the level of development or health, yeah. so you can see where in the spectrum you are, and if you're on healthy Enneagram seven, for example, which I think correlates to NTP pretty well, uh, you don't have a lot of things that average or unhealthy seven has. So I think the stereotypes are usually about average or unhealthy types, the ones that we don't like. And when we are maybe under so much stress, we show some of those, but that doesn't mean that we are that type of person, that unhealthy or um, uh, weird stereotype. I think we are, I mean, the people, the normal people that we see outside in the, in the streets, they are, each is a type. They are not a stereotypes. They are like normal people. So we don't expect people to be those stereotypes, normal people. Those are very um, magnified, negative, uh, or super positive uh, images of that type. The ones that we read about in profiles or in the internet or, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's to be careful with stereotyping too, because um, there's studies that show that stereotyping affects people mentally too. So, for for example, as an Asian, you know, people think that we're as an Asian female, there's a stereotype of bad driver or good at math, and apparently, like people say that what you prime yourself with actually affects how you behave too. So if I if I believe like someone says that I am good at math or someone says I'm bad at driving, it actually affects me mentally. So when I go into a math test and I've been told, you know, Asians are good at math, there are scientific studies done where you actually perform better on that math test. And, and so it's weird, like with stereotypes, they might perpetuate themselves because when people hear it, they might act more in alignment with it. They're harmful in the sense that they, they don't know, they, they're not, accurate <laughs> sometimes like they only portray a very narrow mm. part of that type and it doesn't apply for everyone mm, yeah i think every teenager does that you know they don't use mbti as a tool but as like a validation mechanism oh i'm a debater but i'm an entp you know so <laughs> be be fine with it that's what i do you yeah, know what like i mean it's easy like, to like no dude take... behavior. like yeah yeah like, i think it's it's anyways. just like religions like or anything mm. else People can use it in different ways, and uh, usually we end up seeing people who are uh, unhealthy taking over the entire thing and using it as a like a um, power control thing to uh, mislead others or control others, or I don't know. Um, so I think <laughs> it's just like any other tool, the best thing is to learn it deeply and use it for your advantage and whenever possible, use it to help others. Yeah. Um, going yeah. too far into the, like, naming people, calling people out, to going too far in that direction is uh, really a wrong use of uh, this tool. Uh -huh. And as you can see here, we are, we are all ENTPs, but we are very different. So mm. the, the type isn't everything. I think now we need a book. Uh, we have a lot of books on like Enneagram, MBTI. I think now we need a book that says what personality type isn't. So 
Yeah. What is personal therapy? Uh, but I think now it's more important to know what it is not. Yeah. So mm. uh, it's just a, a it's just a default a structure or framework for preferences, and mm. you can change that. You can manipulate it, change it. Uh, and Carl your Young family, said, uh, your culture, everything shapes that differently. Uh, so it's really, really. Uh, maybe a stupid to think that if you're a certain type, you can predict someone really well. I don't think that's true. Yeah, I feel like having this wide variety of ENTPs show how differently you guys can manifest, but there's still like that core common link. And so, okay, so to slightly talk about my new website coming up called Dynamic Archetypes, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it talks about what personality is not and what it is, like personality theory. And so there, there are two facets that make up your personality. There's your individual personality, the features that are unique to you that come from your, you know, your walk of life, your, your genetics, or every single factor that makes you a unique person. There's your individual personality. And then there's your universal archetype. So this is like an archetype that's been going on even th when you haven't been born. It's been, it, it'll still exist when you're dead. And so it's a universal archetype that is a general pattern that people tend to have. So there's the universal archetype part of you, and then there's the individual personality, which is makes you so diverse. It, it allows for like infinite variation. And like these two things like create your dynamic archetype. And so it's interesting, Jay, how you mentioned like levels of health. And there are levels of health to use the MBTI. You can use the 16 types to to improve yourself or to understand people or you can use it to justify judge them and judge them yeah. and stereotype i agree that there should be like levels of health profiles for the 16 types too that would be really cool and i i want i one day want to write that too so <laughs> that would be cool have to... you looked into yeah. the have you looked into the spiral dynamics model no it, it's really good it's about uh, mapping the level of consciousness not just about yourself, but also the society, and you can like kind of predict where things are going. It's, it's a fascinating research. Mm -hmm. Guy literally interviewed, like a psychologist, literally interviewed like thousands of people, and like came up with this. It's really good. I think Enneagram does a really, really great job helping you uh, see yourself clearly and work on your flaws compared to ENT, ENT, uh, MPTI. MPTI is like wow, you're this awesome guy that is so fantastic with this mm -hmm. strength and these little weaknesses that are not really important, but overall you're great and you're never aware of your weaknesses. But Enneagram really slaps you in the face and says, mm -hmm. hey, you're doing these things and you, mm -hmm. you yourself don't even know that. Yeah, that's typically how they're used, like the Enneagram is more like a slap in the face, but I believe the MBTI could also be a slap in the face. It's just, it's, it's a corporate tool. And what happens is- That is a slap in the face. <laughs> it, like, so they don't want to slap you in the face because they want you to buy your the product. And, and, yeah, but, but what, the it, good thing, the good thing about, what, the, yeah, you go on, so, sorry. Was... So there is the dark side and it's called the Hogan. So the Hogan is like, it will measure your the dark traits that come out of your, natural tendencies. And mm -hmm. they're actually describing MBTI cognitive functions without knowing it. And, and so like, I think if, if the MBTI, if there was someone to make an alternate version of the MBTI, but to include the negative aspects of each trait of each type, then it, it's possible to make the MBTI an indicator of how to improve yourself. It's good information. Thank you. I think the driving force, the, the philosophy which drives self growth and the, the philosophy which helps you become conscious, they use it in occult, this thing too. It's also like famous philosophy in engineering, so Jay might know it. It's a fact that whatever you name, whenever you name something, you have power over it. You can talk about it, you can manipulate it, you can have like a tribe around yeah, it. And I stuff think Jordan like Peterson also it. talks about it really? in his book. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 12 it's, steps. It's an occult 12. thing, yeah. The spells and yeah. stuff. So, yeah, he, he so, also has a really good book, Jordan Peterson. 42 Laws of Life or something? No, 42 12 Rules of Life. Yeah, 12. 12, 12, 12 yeah. okay. Sure. If it was 42, I wouldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Where's your cutoff? Would you do 16 or is it 12? 
Uh, it's actually much less, but but MBTI two loss <laughs> three. I actually made a rule re last year that you need to have either three thirty three or three hundred thirty three of anything. That's so ISTJ of you. I think we'll have to. <laughs> no, I yeah, I I I came up with it, but I never actually followed it. All right. <laughs> I think some ISTJs are are following it. <laughs> Out of curiosity, though, I mean MBTI. Again, I fell into it. I thought it was BS that HR uses. I find I use it in real life, though, because it gives me a vocabulary and concepts to try to understand people. I'm not trying to judge them, but it gives me something that I can guess, okay, what makes this person tick? Because I've had, in a work context, I, retroactive validation is, I can't have everybody, but there are some people I'm very certain about. I approach them and say, do you know MBTI? I believe you're an INFJ assertive. And I would say 80% of the time, I'm bang on. The very fact that I can do it occasionally tells me there's something to it, and it also helps me how to interact with them. If I find somebody mm -hmm. with an ESTJ, which is my nemesis often, if they're not a jumper, it, it gives me <laughs> sorry, it gives me a vocabulary to say, I know what he wants. He wants the illusion of control, and I'm going to give that to him and kind of smooths the gears as long as at the end of the day at 4.45 I give him what he needs as long as I match his expectations we can both get along. MBTI really gives me a framework to make these educated guesses which are better than randomly guessing or looking at a... Yeah. yeah, it gives you a common language to understand what you are know. Yeah, it's a TI framework. I think at the end of the day the way you use it depends on how you feel yourself. If you're, uh, if you have worked on yourself first, and you feel good about yourself, really good, then you try to share that, and you use MBTI or Enneagram or any of these to share that good feeling with others, help others also feel good, uh, be compassionate about them, and if you feel bad inside, if you have problems inside, then you use this tool to attack others. So I think everything starts from myself. It's easier than asking for a birth time and to look up somebody's astrological birth chart. But, <laughs> <you know. laughs> That's a very Taurus thing to say. No, I'm just kidding. Taurus, I actually, um, I, um, yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, really? Whoa, yeah, I just, no, I just I, guessed I, that. Western, Western astrology, I am a Taurus rising in Vedic. I am Rohini's son, yeah. Mm. Yeah, she gave me some info about my from my birth date and time. Yeah, and honestly, it was, it, I, I, I always yeah. thought astrology is BS, but mm. it was precise enough that I don't think it's just like some general thing. Uh, yeah, that's random. So I haven't gone through it. Yet, the astrology. Once I get bored with MBT, about. I'll try that. Yeah, the, the astrology that Farah talks about, I had another person explain to me. It is not like this weird Taurus, 12 signs stuff. It, it, it's much more like complicated and it is multifaceted. Like there is like houses, different opposite houses have like a relationship. And mm. I do see that they also like uh, uh, perform like the same function of naming different aspects of reality. So if you're good at this, then you might be bad at that. And that duality is what helps you. So if you're a thinker, you're not that great at feeler. You know what I mean? So now we know that you're not a great of filler. So now mm -hmm. you know that's like a blind side. I think that way it kind of does help, but it's just too complicated for me. But but I think there is like something to it. Uh, excuse me. Um, I just wanted to say I w it's, I'm really grateful that I got to be on the show and meet all of you. I'm going to head out now because it's my birthday and I got to be with my oh, family. Oh, happy, birthday. happy birthday. Sam. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Oh, so, so Chad, yeah. last question. So what type is your birthday cake? I'm not having cake. I'm on a strict keto diet. <laughs> awesome. yeah. That's that's a, that's a nine TCA cake. Yeah, done. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll, put, I'll put strawberries on top of a cracker or something. I'll, I'll yeah. Dude, you can make a keto mug cake. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, for what it's worth, I'm a Leo. Yeah. I don't know if that means anything to any of you guys, but same Leo. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm bored in astrology, but that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Um, anyway, see you guys. Nice see you. Take care. Happy, Happy birthday. Enjoy your day. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Cogfun, you guys probably know him as um, Jay right here. 
Uh, <laughs> so we were just having conversations. Since I have like some astrological knowledge um, <clears throat> and he's got all like the MBTI knowledge. So we're, we uh, try to like compare birth charts to see like, okay, what, let's see if there's a correlation somehow. And actually there was, and um, there it's, Probably, you probably might have, like, as NTPs, there might be, like, a Uranus, like, a really strong Uranus aspect to one of your, like, personal planets or, because he has an Aquarius moon. I've got very strong Uranus aspects, mm -hmm. but anyways, I will not say Uranus. I'd rather say Uranus, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> must, must be that TI, you know? <laughs> must be that TI that contributes that aspect. Yeah. Relationships. What's a good strategy? First of all. Uh, are you oh, single boy. in a relationship? Anything? And what do you think uh, is a uh, what What is a good strategy for ENTPs in terms of uh, relationships? So I'm single, right? So my strategy is basically it, it's almost like that aeroplane thing. If the, if the the plane is diving down, you put the oxygen mask for yourself first, and then you know get another mm. person. Angels don't live in hell, so you better make it a heaven. And if you yourself oh, are not right. living in a heaven. So it's, it's, there's no point, you know. So it's like, it, I think, you know, people people use love like a fish love, where they use love like, you know, oh, uh, it's it's almost like if you do this, it, it's it's a fish love, right? Why do you eat fish? Because it feels good to me. Oh, that is why you take, took it out of the water, killed it and boiled it and ate it. And it, it, fish love isn't good if you're using the other person as a vehicle for your own gratification. True yeah. love is a love of giving, not a love of receiving. Because when you give something to others, you're giving a part of yourself, right? So when you give, there's a part of yourself that starts becoming in them. So when a part of yourself starts becoming in them, there's a part of you in them that you start loving. Mm. You see? So it's very DI. Yeah. So true love is really a love of giving and not a love of receiving. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what. So I think, yeah. I think if you're like an ENTP, just do you. Learn how to be happy by yourself first, and if the other I mean, person does the job happy. right, we are usually happy. Yeah, but that if the other person is like a when if the other person does the same thing, you should like meet each other, ideally. Mm. So you become maybe jaded over time, but um, one thing I've, I've, <laughs> what I've learned, <laughs> no, no, no. here's an exercise. This is somewhat a bit of a tangent, but one thing I find that really helps. To, all, to gauge a person how compatible they are and also to help the relationship is being able to, let's say you have a disagreement, to step back and say, you know what, I'm going to tell you, you tell me what's on your mind, and then I'm going to repeat to you what I believe you said, what your motivation was and what you're feeling to validate it. And you do that up to the point where the person says, yes, you know what, you understood me, and then you flip it around. I've had... From my experience, somebody that's not willing to do that is somebody that you don't want to waste your time with. Because I ran into that a couple of times. And when you do that, it really helps to take the, if you sort of make it a default, hey, we have trouble, let's do this exercise. Uh, it's sort of prescriptive, but it works for me because you have sort of a baseline you can go to where you're respectful of each other, you validate each other, and you, and you get to a point where the other person feels heard. And often by that time, you can... It's not the problem goes away, but you've taken the heat out of it, and often good stuff comes from it. Mm -hmm. Like just as an exercise, I'm going to honesty and communication. Yes, good communication. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. and then some people don't understand you. It's just they have different values. You will find out very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's type related. Like uh, no, people can be any type, but good communicators, mature. Um, yeah, because you know, initially when I trends? You know, mm, when I learned trends MBTI or... in the beginning, I thought there is like a magic formula that tells you who's the best type, best match for you. But uh, from experience and just thinking more, reading more, learning more, analyzing more, I realized type is really irrelevant. So you, any type healthy can have a good relationship with any other type, healthy, and that starts again with yourself, I think. Yeah, that goes for relationships and it goes for like careers too. Like th there might be like general, like general patterns, but you can excel at anything. Like if you 
find a way to... Like Boris said, yeah, uh, if you're a good communicator, you can use type to say, hey, these are the things that stresses me out, and these are the things that stresses you out. Um, so let's find a common ground. If, as long as there is communication and a framework for it, like the one that you mentioned, uh, repeating, validating, as long as you have that, I think uh, the rest is just every type has its own uh, beauty. So, yeah. They say uh, the biggest indicator of relationships succeeding is uh, John Gottman. He has the four horsemen and with it, I think he he can predict relationships failing or succeeding with an, I think 95% accuracy I, and it's like, the four horsemen are the biggest indicators of relationship success or four failure. Mm. Something about contempt, that's like the, the sure sign that it's not going to last. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, that all comes back to communication style. And I think there's a lot to be said for knowing what your own needs are and, you know, um, being realistic about, you know, somebody can be a really great person, but if they, if their needs are really just not a match mm -hmm. for yours, then that, that's not going to, to be a good long-term approach. And I know that for myself and my own style, something that I need is a fair amount of independence, you know, and, um, and somebody else who wants, um, you know, a relationship that has, uh, I, I don't know what the word for it is, but that maybe has a hard time <laughs> accepting, well, I would, I would perceive it as clingy, but they would maybe have a different, different uh, level of, of need for, you know how how constant or or how how close or maybe doesn't understand that need for independence and that's just not going to work interesting and so that brings us to the topic of relationship deal breakers what is a deal breaker for you guys <laughs> controlling controlling Ingress. people Indeed. yep yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't control me bro <laughs> <laughs> so truthful people that like even the little white lies probably irritate us a lot um we're probably misunderstood a little bit too for me drama you know if uh somebody has a need drama? to constantly mm. be sewing some sort of mild emotional conflict or any kind of manipulation just come out for me i need i need my time to be respected a lot like I'm fine if we like plan a day to just mm -hmm. hang out and do nothing together. That's fine. But someone who, I guess it maybe comes down to cleanliness, but like someone who doesn't respect my time, for example, if they're always late, it's like that irks me after like, maybe it's not like an immediate deal breaker, but like, and interestingly as a P also, like I tend to be pretty punctual. So those kind of things like bother me because I'm like, if you weren't going to show up, that's fine. But like, mm -hmm. I have stuff I could be doing. Like, it's just like, People who don't respect my time in like friendships or relationships, it just bugs me pretty quickly. It's not like an immediate thing, obviously. It's not like you're late once, I hate you. Like, I don't really care. But like, that's the one that builds up annoyance in me the quickest, I think. Just not respecting my time in general. Like, if I'm studying and someone like disregards that, like, and they're like, oh, we should just hang out. I'm, like, I'm busy. You know, like, just stuff like that. Like, as a college student, also, like, my life revolves around school right now. So, what's your major? Uh, biology, mm. like genetics. Interesting, exciting. Yeah, it's really fun. Mm. <laughs> yeah, to second the other ones, and then certain a lack of open-mindedness, a rigidity paired with pessimism is just oh God. really yeah. draining. Something that doesn't allow for possibility looks at it always from the negative angle, and and then you say, how about this? Like, well, shoots it down right away. That's that's gets a good point. Under. Yeah. Mm. You heard yeah. in your folks how not to be in a relationship with an ENTP. <laughs> I, I, I think at least for me, if, if they are like following their passion and stuff, but but I don't want like my partner being more extroverted than me, probably like an introverted writer would do, you know, but say it's someone just has a mission, just doing something they are doing, I'm doing something I'm doing, we can like bond over the consume part. What I realized even like after like surveying a lot of people, even if you have like different types, what people really bond over is like their interest. So if you are a like completely different type, right? But you both love maths, you can still uh, math. You can still like have a good relationship over mm -hmm. the math. But if the person is like doing physics, another person is doing psychology, but you both like maths, they're like that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. I think we are good at uh, liking other people's interests. Like if mm -hmm. they're doing something totally ir irrelevant to what we do, 
we become interested in what I, they do. I agree. And maybe we actually become better at it at some day. Mm. Some point. Some point. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, yeah when I'm hanging out with someone I always pick up on the stuff that they do and are interested in. If they play a sport, I like try to learn about it. If they like a show, I watch it, like mm. etc. Yeah. Like to breed the connection and the relatable ness. Mm the relatable content in between and us. I think something that's very important is is uh, because we are not very uh, naturally good at organizing our own lives uh, yeah. but we, we we try we find systems we create systems we find ways to manage it if the if the other person thinks that we are good at it and throws all of their stuff at us to manage those as well that becomes mm. really frustrating because we, in the first place, need someone that can help us with the organization and management of our own day-to-day -day things. So if they, just because we have a system and we can't take care of it, it doesn't mean that we are willing to do it, especially but for someone else too. So I think, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, like it comes like a lot of UTPs come across as like inspiring. Like people look up to us, or like they look to us as a leader, even if we don't feel like we're leaders or we don't want to be leaders necessarily. Mm -hmm. People end up looking up to us, and I think in relationship, what I would want the most is to not be put on a pedestal. You know, I want them to just hang out with me. I don't want them to be like, "Wow, you're amazing because of all these yeah. things." I'm like, I don't really care for that necessarily. Like that's image versus like getting to know me if if anything i wouldn't want my partner to idealize me like at all that brings us to the enneagram because jace jc you're a, a enneagram three, three yeah. and threes because they accomplish so much people can kind of admire that and yeah. i was wondering what is everyone's enneagram type if you know it probably lots of seven <laughs> and i think i think a lot of entps would think they are threes no uh, insult, no nothing. I don't know how much study you've done. I'm not an expert in, in the Enneagram. Uh, so <laughs> sure. just talking in general, and because I myself typed myself in the beginning as a three, uh, one of the reasons ENTPs think they are threes is because they look for positive feedback and they mistake that with image consciousness and also ENTPs, especially the healthy ones, are very accomplished. They, are, they have done so many different things and they, are, they work so fast and they do so many different things uh, masterfully almost that they think they are achievers. But they don't do those things. They haven't accomplished all of those because they wanted to accomplish them. They were doing something that was fun. They loved doing it and those accomplishments came with it. But achievers who are threes, they have that accomplishment, whether it's a degree, whether it's a certain amount of money or some skills, some certificate. They have that in their mind first, then they work towards that. They kill themselves to get it. And uh, also their image consciousness causes them not to reveal uh, their true self, which is different from seven, who reveals part of themselves, not all of themselves. Um, and also seven hesitates to share the negative part of themselves because they think that will uh, bring down the mood or uh, uh, they always try to elevate the mood of the, the, the people around them. So I think uh, a lot of ENTPs uh, think they are threes, but they are actually accomplished healthy sevens. Um, so just that's just my take on it, which could be wrong. All right, um, and I don't think anyone, any NTP who's a three is not a three. It's just my understanding of it. For me, try type seven two eight or a two. They always flip around, but I I second the seven. Seven. I will say that prefacing that I'm uh, I haven't spent enough time in Enneagram to have overly identified with, uh, mm -hmm. with any of it. So, I mean, I, this, the closest thing I've ever uh, come to reading something that I identified with was the second social description. For me, it was between the three and the seven. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't <laughs> delved too much into it because I just haven't. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Sarah just went underground because she'll be asked next. <laughs> 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 Whatever my type is, Farah is definitely that type. So we talk to each other a lot. 
and we are too similar. And I think from everything that everyone said, uh, ANTP, like if, if someone wanted to type us from the Enneagram standpoint, they would think, I think, they would think we are all sevens because of all these interests, being good at being quick learners, wanting to be positive in good relationship with others. And uh, so, yeah. So I am on the MBTI community. People know that I've been an advocate for finding a one-to-one -one co relationship between MBTI and Enneagram because I think they are basically describing the same thing from two different perspectives. They are not, but a lot of people say they are two different things. They are measuring different things, which I disagree with. Because Ross Hudson and um, Don Rizzo, one of the pioneers in the Enneagram, they actually were the first who tried to find uh, a correlation between each type and each cognitive function. So there exists a correlation, and it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just trying to find, uh, tune it to find a better one, because I think it has some errors in it. I remember you posting a tweet about how I think Don Rizzo Hudson said that TE t people tend to be ones or threes. Yes. And so even like the people who founded the Enneagram or was one of the pioneers has correlated MBTI and, and also the Enneagram together. So that's really yeah. fascinating discovery. Yeah, the only thing they couldn't figure out was type three. They couldn't link it to any of the cognitive function. There were eight functions, nine types. That's, that's uh, what I wanted to say. Yeah. yeah. So Nothing. they they correlated each type with uh, each function, um, and they couldn't correlate anything, or they preferred not to correlate three with any of them. Uh, but I think three is correlated with uh, TE more than any other function, because it's, it's uh, three. Three is all about efficiency, goals, uh, goal oriented, achiever. Uh, these are very TE things. And most people say ENTJs are, uh, and ESTJs are eight. Yeah, but you should combine the theory with your own experience and observations. Then you will yeah. see that uh, mm -hmm. um, it's, you will find some new things. Once I finalize my thoughts, I'll probably put That's it somewhere cool. in a blog or something. That's somewhere. great. Yeah. Or you could also contribute it to my website. So with my sure. website, Dynamic Archetypes, uh, one of the projects we're doing is I'm going to get like any users who love linking MBTI to every other theory to like get together and to like try to combine the cognitive functions with like every theory out there imaginable. And I think with the Enneagram, mm -hmm. it would be really interesting to see like the trends and the correlations behind that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I don't understand is why is there a need to have a simplistic one-to-one -one map, eight on eight? You can have statistical correlations, which are distributions that relate certain functions or types to, there's no need to try to map them one-on-one. -on -one. It's an unnecessarily strict constraint where you might actually lose the real view of reality because you're restricting yourself. You just have different vocabulary. Why, why trying to narrow it? That's what I don't mm -hmm. know. Subtleties I between think different sorts of, of, uh, of models out there that are that are measuring slightly different things that focus on a different aspect of the thing. So I actually appreciate the nuance that comes from understanding the difference between you know one typing system versus another typing system. I think Enneagram has, unlike MBTI, Enneagram has very, very precise, extended, accurate profile descriptions for each type. If uh, one uh, can find a one-to-one -one correlationship, you can use those descriptions for better understanding of the functions. So, because there are not many good descriptions on the functions. Uh, we, all we have are limited descriptions from the Jung, from Jung and uh, from just random descriptions from others, and then general descriptions for types, ENTP, NFV, INTJ. So, if one can prove that seven is NE, then everything you read about seven in all those extended, great, accurate details are actually NE, which gives you a very, very good understanding of NE, SE, NE, uh, DOM, SI, inferior. And you understand SI inferiors very well. I've done it myself, and that has um, helped me a lot, understanding the functions and everything. 
Um, but I know a lot of people don't believe in it. They say Enneagram is measuring something else, nurture versus MBTI, which is nature. And there are a mm. lot of theories that can that say any MBTI, any a lot of Enneagram teachers, uh, not a lot of them, at least one of them that I know, uh, thinks that any MBTI type can be any Enneagram type. Uh, but it's something I believe in and I'm just trying to. Okay, I, I agree <laughs> with all of you, and I will explain why. <laughs> that was such an F.E. statement. I agree with everyone. I feel placated. So, <laughs> so Jay is right in the sense that I've also read Enneagram descriptions, and I've went like, these are just in-depth, like cognitive function descriptions too. But I can also see how you can have very diverse Enneagram types within a certain MBTI type. But like, they're all true. Everything that you all are saying is true because I can see where you guys are coming from. If, if you look at it in one frame, you can see an exact correlation. If you look at it from another frame in the middle, you can see that there's a trend, but not like one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. yeah. being, as being desirable, I just say the moment you have something really restrictive, the odds of reality turning out in your favor diminish. And I don't see a need to to fill this, it's almost like a goal. Yes, I want to describe the world in eight in eight functions. I don't think it's realistic. And I would rather go, and I'm not uh, trying to offend you, Jay. It's just- No, no, it's fine. Not. We're just- Because you're fellow entities. You're all the entities, yeah. <laughs> no one. <laughs> Feel <laughs> free. This is it's like physics. I mean, you describe something. Sometimes you want to do it simple, but sometimes you need to add a new theory to capture it all and not to give in to, oh, I want to simplify this. It's desirable. I don't think- it is likely to succeed, you can still establish correlations. There are distributions, but a good way of testing is you test a bunch of folks in Enneagram, you test a bunch in MBTI, you get a distribution. These distributions exist. But how reliable are the tests? Well, th Not that's very reliable. Well, that's a but, whole other problem. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, I'm just saying mm -hmm. it would be great. I don't think the world will collapse into that nice little formula. I could be wrong. All, I, all I'm saying is uh, MBTI is describing um like Nature. this is this is a person right the person doesn't change enneagram and mbti are, are describing the same thing they are describing the same person right and uh they are just two different descriptions and i think if i combine them i'll have a more accurate description oh, combine are, something different. That, that might make a more complex theory we might end up with 512 types oh that's all been <laughs> Wow. <laughs> mm, sounds, sounds something very similar. 16, <laughs> type, 16 times uh, 9 times 2 subtypes and then 3 sub, other subtypes, yeah. That would be then, so fun. Then it becomes mm. like just our names. Like I'm another person, you're another person. We have nothing in common. Yeah. 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 And, and so here's how I see like all of your points of views coming together. So <laughs> I, I, my FE agrees with all of you. <laughs> and so like me and Morgan were at the last personality hacker event and it, we had MBTI and, and Jungian theory. And then after that, the last day we did the Enneagram. And so they were Enneagram typing someone on stage who is an INFP. And he was talking about his FI and then they typed him as a type four. And then what happened is I, I sat with him and I had lunch with him after and he was like, you know, what I was describing, it was all just FI. And so like he got typed as type four because he would say all of these FI things. And so a, a large part of some of the type four descriptions on the internet have a very strong like FI flavor. And so I'm not saying that someone with FE can't be it, but I think that if someone with FE was a type four, Four, it would come out differently than a person who was a type four and an FI user. Because if there was a finer distinction made, like, okay, so this is the FE type four and this is the FI type four, then you'd have that interesting, interesting description. With some of the descriptions, when I read it, it like, or even when he, the person was typed on stage, it was really interesting how all he was doing was describing FI. And so, all, all when the Enneagram practitioner was talking on stage, it was just a more in-depth look into how, like the stages of health of an FI user. But, but there, I, I'm saying it's possible to be FE in type four, but, but mm -hmm. like the thing is, 
it, it's interesting that sometimes the Enneagram is describing like different stages of health of the different cognitive functions, but sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's that person is genuinely that Enneagram type, even though it's not correlated with their cognitive function. But then that description would be slightly different than a person who would be a different set of cognitive functions, but with that Enneagram type. I see, I see what you mean. I yeah. feel as an ENTP, right? So I myself have like mixed fields, mixed philosophies and stuff like that. And what I find is if you really like want to make mix MBTI and Enneagram, you really need to have the outcome set. Okay, what outcome do you desire? Are you like eliminate? Are you trying to eliminate emotional problems? Are you trying to hire people? Are you trying to like find their life purpose? For what purpose are you like mixing these two, you know? With that outcome in mind, you can definitely like see correlations. But I do not think uh, you can have like a, I mean, of course, you might have like a one-to-one -one correlation that might, you know, just explain everything. But I think it's just more beneficial to have, okay, you know what, in this context, the MBTI and Enneagram like mixes this way. So you understand this function this way, stuff like that. Well, there won't be a one-to-one -one correlation because they're man-made systems and they'll mm. fundamentally disagree on principles just because it's man-made. But I think it, you can also say that it is one on one to one because the truth is like like if you look at the truth without looking at a man made system like maybe the enneagram and the MBTI are pointing at a true phenomenon and so if if you were to just look at it apart from the systems and the rules of the systems and to just try to capture it as like one unifying thing you might be able to figure out the one-to-one -one correlations which also include the clusters and the just distributions because what one to one this what 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 one to one correlation means is that the logic is like pure to me like that's what it means like when you look at it you can clearly trace back why things are the certain way that they are because certain times like you'll 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 have a correlation in a system but you'll be like it kind of makes sense but it kind of doesn't but to take out that ambiguity that kind of like uncertainty i'm so sorry i feel like i, I i'm speaking I'm taking up your time sorry no it's good no, 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 no it's good we have also, you know, when ENTPs are not talking over, that's when you know you have cold, right? And You're like a, absorbing. I would say like the last thing the world needs is yet another typology system. But if yeah. you have something pure, maybe but you have 16, to start with pure TI and do a whole 16 lot. times 9 is 144. That's a great number. We can say we're <laughs> I, I personally, <laughs> I really objective like, personality, guys. I personally like the objective personality model, 512 types that can collapse neatly down into the 16 types um, so that you can take those 16 types and use the common language of everybody else, but add the additional nuance, the additional qualifiers onto them so that you still have some common language, but you're, you're getting more nuance. Um, but I, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I like type systems that are like DLC packs that you can take your original understanding of the 16 types and add the DLC pack of like OP yeah. or the DLC pack of whatever else. <laughs> it's not like a completely separate system, but it's like an enhancement, you know? Mm, <laughs> it's just nine it's, coins or so two power nine, five, 12, kind of yeah. works that way. Uh -huh. How does everyone identify what their emotions are since we have so much trouble? How? Yes, how do you know what it is you're feeling? Okay, so I have this one theory, right? It's not theory, I cannot know it's true, but here's my TI, right? It's like, every thought is a loving thought. That's the truth. But no, it's like, every thought is a loving thought. So the philosophy here is, every thought that is not a loving thought is a wasted thought, right? But now but now a person would say, what? But what if I hate Hitler, right? Hitler killed Jews, isn't that a hateful thought? I'm like, no, it's still coming from a place of love. But the only question is, can you see it or not? You know, that's what it's like. Every thought by itself is coming from a place of, you know, I love this. That's why I chose to do this. Or I am attached to this very particular belief or aspect of reality, which is why I chose to do this. But when you're looking at it from another person's perspective, it's not that clear. It's like, but but I like oranges. What do you mean you like peaches? You know, and, and you like start arguing, you see. And uh, I think that really like comes down to the identity of the people we identify with, like me or Joyce or whatever. But I think every thought is a loving thought. The only That's why I keep asking myself, every thought is a loving thought. Everything that I'm seeing is a person is coming from a place of love. So the only question is, can I see it or not? You know, and, and I use that as like a resolution thing because it's very easy to get trapped in darkness. Uh, and uh, it's just a very easy way to like stay positive. Just, you know, move through life. Okay. I, th I think, uh, because feeling is, is feeling is in our 
is our feeling is unconscious. Uh, when we feel bad, we don't know exactly what it is. And we mm. try to rationalize it, talk about it. That's why we like to talk about this stuff. But sometimes you keep talking about something that happened to you and you don't feel very satisfied at the end, which is an indicator that your logical analysis is not a good way of expressing your feeling. So there is a technique, uh, active imagination, um, that I learned about in a book, Undervalued Self, by uh, Ellen Aron, I guess. The same person who wrote the sensitive personality, uh, high, highly sensitive personality, HSP, <laughs> the, the same author. Uh, she has a great book, Undervalued Self. I recommend it to everyone. Um, she talked about a technique, active imagination, but even if you don't know that technique, I think some sort of image, uh, meditation where you just, uh, and when you practice it enough, you become really good and fast at it, just like how, for example, FI users are. So you, you give yourself some silent, uh, some time for silence and just letting your feelings come out. They will come out. They will tell you, they will tell you how you feel about something or a situation or in general, how you feel. So allowing yourself and, uh, so blocking the analysis and allowing the feelings come out, um, uh, in med in a meditation for just silence, listening to yourself that helps you identify your feelings and also, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you have seen the list of feelings, just reading through them to see which one uh, is you right now. And, uh, and that helps just like exercising, going to the gym. Every time you practice, you become better. Your muscles become stronger. I think every time we, we try expressing our feelings and identifying them, uh, we become faster at it, more accurate. And after a while, uh, I think we feel uh, a little uh, more relieved and less tense with our feelings. That's my own experience. Oh, and I find that interesting because, I mean, obviously, that seems to be resonated. So you're saying that the average ENTP has difficulties recognizing their feelings and or acknowledging them because I can't fully relate. I find I come from a place of I'm a detached observer, yet I can feel or mirror what other people feel. But by myself, I'm very content. And I think if somebody asked me, how do you feel about something? I can normally label that. Very rarely do I have very intense feelings, especially not aggressive ones. So I find that interesting because there seems to be a trend that suggests ENTPs are struggling with recognition. No, it's not that. We're, maybe you haven't had any trauma, traumatic experiences. I have. Your <laughs> It, or, or maybe, yeah. maybe you have raised in a culture or in a family where uh, there are healthy ways of, uh, where you have learned a healthy ways of expressing yourself or, uh, or you're not in a situation where it's not so easy to express your feelings. Uh, uh, so uh, it could be your case. Or maybe you think you're content, but you're not. Maybe you think you're content and you don't have bad feelings because you don't want to have bad feelings. Uh, uh, and that's how you, that, the, the main reason we distract ourselves with so many different things is because we don't want to stay with ourselves and our own uh, negative feelings. I think, uh, yeah, that's why. Well, and, and I, I would agree with Boris. I'm, I'm coming from the same place. I feel like most of the time I am a detached observer for myself and for other people around me. You know, with people around me, there's not very much that happens um, with other people around me that I feel overly bothered by. I feel like, huh, that's interesting. Other people may be getting upset by it, but I'm, I'm, I'm more observing than reacting most of the time. Mm -hmm. And for myself as well. And so when I am bothered by something, sometimes it takes a while. Um, and, and I'll know that I'm, I, I can put a name on it. Like Boris said, I, I feel like I can put a name on it just fine. The question is, do I want to take any action on it? And sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Um, but I, I'm not. Again, I, I, I think we are just really, really, really good at distracting ourselves 
and taking our mind into places that are pleasing and we just think that there is nothing that at least that's true about myself i cannot generalize it but i've caught i i was the person who thought i have like i'm not upset with anything i'm just happy everything's good <laughs> sure. but there were things down there yep. that would oh, like uh, there give me things, the, but it's yeah still, so um, yeah i've learned to like listen to those identify them and bring them out when that happens i have less my need for distraction and being positive and being happy is less i don't have that much need for that so that's my take on it i think uh, it's not more of feeling stuff i i think the problem really comes when you know when like life slaps you in the face and now you feel stuck and when you feel stuck you cannot see a way out and now mm-hmm. you feel something in this state of uh-huh. mind you feel something now yeah. now what do you do you know and that is where i think it really gets, i don't think it's i i would describe it as feeling of feeling stuck but it's like the more you try to like think the more you see your damn i'm like more stuck you become and then it's just like a so so what do you do now so i, I think uh, jay is talking about those kind of feelings Oh, so Which, that's uh, something I can definitely resonate with. I've, I've felt yeah. stuck. Um, yeah. I think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And I don't know if it was a, a difficulty in, in naming it. I'm certain I was able to name the, the stuckness. Um, yeah, sure. I, and I don't know how to address Morgan's question, really. I mean, for me, it's more a matter of I can, I can label it. The question is how to move forward and sometimes... You know, there might not be an immediate answer for that, mm. but I feel like sometimes I've gotten into a, a situation where I feel like, you know, processing my feelings on this isn't going to make me feel better. You know, it's going to make me feel better. A solution is going to make me feel better. Mm. <laughs> so I'll work toward the solution rather than working toward figuring out my own feelings. About yeah, because I know I feel like I know that's a typical are. thinking I response. Have, yeah. How do I move forward from it? I personally think that, like, in regards to situations, ENTPs are really fast to, like, adapt really quickly at anything that's thrown at us, except for, like, emotional curveballs. I think that's one of our big weaknesses. So I think if, like, we had prepared in advance by, like, setting up, like, a TE boundary or, like, you know, like, expecting something, like, you know, things that we anticipated, we anticipate a lot of things, but if we didn't anticipate something, I think that's when we get stuck. That's when we're like, oh, crap, what do we do? Because... In the moment with emotional stuff, I think we're not necessarily as good. But if we had prepared for it a little bit in advance, like we saw it coming, then it's okay. But if we're blindsided, I think that's, at least for me, maybe it goes over late. But at least for me, that's when it's like the worst, when I didn't expect it. And if it's like a normal thing, then it's fine. But if it's an emotional thing that I didn't expect and I'm blindsided, then that's when I, I don't know. I don't know how to react necessarily. Also, I wanted to add that uh, having a weak FI doesn't necessarily mean being disabled to process your negative feelings it also could mean uh, not going deeply into everything uh, a lot of experiences and not um, experiencing the deep joy of some of the feelings because you're not deeply invested in some of the things could be a person could be uh, an experience but again Again, it has to do with level of health. Healthy sevens or ENTPs, I think, uh, they're good at this. So they are actually deeply connected to all their experiences. That's why someone like Da Vinci or Feynman tries something deeply, uh, connects to something deeply, invests in it, becomes really good at it, then moves on to the neighbors, becomes good at those things too. But it's if you are if we catch ourselves escaping from things and moving around trying different experiences without completing the previous ones that's an indicator that we have some pain inside and we are escaping them so that's a good moment to uh, to stay calm and identify the feelings do something about them like you said the solution uh, then we can we don't have that need to constantly be on the go or energized or positive or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like Jay, what you're saying is sometimes extroverts will avoid introspection by engaging with the outer world more. So it's like doubling down with the extroversion instead mm. of looking inside. This is true. 
Yeah, so I actually have a, a meeting on the phone. They're calling me. Uh, For sure. So I have to leave. I apologize, but I really, really enjoyed talking to you guys and knowing all of you. And thank you for this opportunity for me yeah, to also it share was, my thoughts. It was so fun to talk to you, Cognitive Function. I've been reading cog your fun. tweets. Yeah. <laughs> your tweets are so cog fun. They're very fun. <laughs> and I've always respected and really loved them. Um, and I'm sure thank your you. students think you're a brilliant professor, too. Uh, and so thank you for coming out. It was nice to put like a face to your tweets. Now, like, I get to like meet you and you're okay. very like, thank you. Like, thank yeah, I, I love how you challenge people with thoughts that are maybe unconventional, but it has truth to it. And right. it, it gives us a good discussion point. And I really, really appreciate that. And so thank you so much for coming thank out. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, Goodbye. thanks. We'll see you. You Bye. all have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. And so let's close off the panel too. Unless you guys have some final thoughts you want to say, uh, I'll leave some time for that too. Like, so any any final thoughts? About what? Yeah, boy, you can join me though. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I know a lot yeah. of thoughts, but <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Hmm, where should I start? Final thoughts. How much time do we have? Yeah, maybe yeah. we'll have like a part two one day. <laughs> but thank you so much, everyone, for coming thank out. You. I appreciated all of these, the multi multiplicity of thoughts that you guys brought. It was really enriching with the variety of opinions you all had. And I really enjoyed the fun humor within it and like the sharp remarks within this panel. And it, there was always like really, really well thought out points of view. And we explored a topic honestly without anyone getting offended. And I really appreciate that that we can just talk and say things and that we're all okay with that. <laughs> and so oh, just <laughs> and just to let you guys know, like ENTP Nurture has an ENTP channel and JC also has a YouTube channel uh, called 3C7. Yeah. And you should go check that out too. Boris has an online meetup, intuitive meetups. Um, and Men Wendy is there, it's in Toronto, it's like a Zoom chat. And Morgan, she has a website, she writes these really, really eloquently written blog posts. And if you want to see her wonderful stream of consciousness and just the brilliant ENTP thoughts she has, go check out her blog. And oh, thank you. Yeah. I if just you're some of the post down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to put them up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh, for sure. And Farah ha has a Twitter that I'll link below as well. You guys are just filled with joy, filled with, you know, all these multiple talents that you guys have, filled with, you know, an abundance of knowledge from different disciplines. And I really appreciated hearing your takes, your ENTP nature nurture. <laughs> your, your ENTP nurture and nature was amazing. And I loved hearing the ENTPs unleashed, you know, the N NE, just mm. exploring all the thoughts, having all the thought experiments together. It was a really fun metaphysical playground for two hours with you guys. So thank you so much for that. And I just, you know, as also INFJs get shipped with ENTPs all the time. And I can see why ENTPs, they're, they're fantastic people. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're cool. And yeah, you know, anyone, anyone will want to be with an ENTP after this panel. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I was just worried that, you know, everyone would like live up to the stereotype. Oh, I'm a debater. So I have to debate. No, you're wrong. No, I'm wrong. <laughs> but surprisingly, everyone is awesome here. No, I think and, I'm and wrong. I just oh, never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? Wait, what did you say? I'm wrong? You're, what? You're wrong. I'm never wrong. No, no, you're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was I'm bad. right. Painful. I'm glad. What I like though was this, I mean, the expectation could have been it's a bunch of guys, everybody wants to talk, 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 and we talk over each other. We were very respectful. There were even quiet moments yeah. in between, right? Chill. So. Yeah, yeah, the reality was like, you know, oh, I can see that, sure, you know, but I'm going to like work on my TI. <laughs> and that, that was like the reality. Nurture, we've all learned some social skills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
not the junior yes. high. <laughs> Joyce is good influence. Thanks, Joyce, for putting up with us for two and a half hours now. You Thank gotta you. Our a little bit, I that, guess. That that was rather <laughs> ambitious of your blast to put eight ENTPs in a room. So congrats on getting through that. Congrats, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also my secret project to become friends with as many ANTPs as possible. You guys enhanced me, so thanks. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so final question for you, uh, Joyce. ENTPs versus ENFPs. So which one would you choose? <laughs> yeah, go on. Tell That's ENTPs. <laughs> you know right answer. answer carefully though, Joyce. <laughs> I'm going to be very hurt based on what you say. I feel like there might be a bias in this panel, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, you're the one who put this panel together, so. Yeah. The cold out of truth, we want to. <laughs> Give us that TI. So, Give us so that TI, Joyce. I'm about to switch out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, alternatively, you could, we'll give you like a different question if you want. Um, out of the ENTPs who are left in the call, who's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, either one. Either, yeah, I think the first question is a like one. Yeah. It's like, you know what I'm having on my salad today, right? Uh, I don't know. ENTP what debater. salsa should I have on my salad? Guys, uh, the, there's a really nice bird outside. Uh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for coming out. <laughs> tonight. You guys can DM, DM me, and I'll answer honestly. But <laughs> it's too too public. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But you get to edit it out, though. You can take this part out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Come true. On. She's gonna message each of us that we're her favorite. You that's what that, 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 an FB dom does. That's plan. And the play energy comes out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right. So thank you everyone for watching. You NTPs have been so playful. <laughs> and I'll see you all. Bye. <laughs> oh, what's your eye? What's your eye? <laughs> <laughs>